Adhitiya 200 Mbps speed deka ke. Sri Lanka ve vegavat masaha pulul tama home broadband sambandh tave vana. SLT Mobitel deshe fiber bala vege opat adam atvidinna. Hari masudui. First at 9 this Friday, the 15th of September, 2023. Probing allegations. Three-member committee appointed by President Ranil Vikramasinghe to investigate the Channel 4 Easter attack expose. Confident. Acting Finance Minister hopeful of completing the domestic debt restructuring process by next week. Sustainability. Central Bank Governor highlights the importance of tax payment to sustain free education and health. Reform implementation. New law to govern state-owned enterprises by the end of this year reveals the head of the SOE restructuring unit. Hopefully that will get to parliament by December this year. We are working on that. Obey Vishwasi Dino Sinsudain. Then, Lagamati Pharmacy in Labat at Hacker. Rhino Cement Roofing Sheets. Unama Milata Kal Pavati Navaharayak. This is Ada Verna First at Nine. From Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to Other Dharana First at 9. I'm Adhya Dhrisingha joining you live with the latest in Sri Lanka and around the world. Now in your top story tonight, President Ranil Vikramasinghe and Cuban President Miguel Diaz-Canel exchanged views on bolstering the relationship between the two countries, focusing on collaboration in medicine, healthcare, sports training and coconut cultivation. Addressing the media after the meeting, President Vikramasinghe pledged support to Cuba at the United Nations resolutions put forward against them and added that Cuba will also support Sri Lanka, vice versa. During his visit to Cuba to address the G77 plus China summit, President Ranil Vikramasinghe called on Cuban President Miguel Diaz-Canel and engaged in bilateral discussions reinforcing the bonds of friendship and dialogue between the two nations. While recalling the history of bilateral cooperation between Sri Lanka and Cuba, particularly in multilateral fora, both the leaders identified areas of future cooperation, including in the fields of public health, agriculture and sports. He also highlighted Cuba's role in addressing North-South gaps in science, technology and innovation, expressing willingness to share expertise, particularly in vaccine deployment. According to the President's media division, the two leaders emphasized on the importance of bolstering the relationship between the two countries, focusing on collaborations in medicine, healthcare, sports training and coconut cultivation. President Vikramasinghe expressed Sri Lanka's commitment to supporting Cuba in international fora, while President Diaz-Canel assured support for Sri Lanka regarding human rights resolutions. We've discussed of strengthening the ties between Cuba and Sri Lanka. We've also asked for exchange on views and having an agreement in the field of medicine and health, also in re regard to sports trainers. And we can also give some help and advice in regard to the growing of coconut. But more than that, we have agreed that we will work together to strengthen the South. And as usual, we continue to support Cuba and to keep supporting the resolutions you bring up in the UN. Similarly, Cuba will support us in respect of the human rights resolutions that are being brought against Sri Lanka. Now, meanwhile, President Ranil Vikramasinghe appointed a committee to investigate allegations leveled by the Channel for Expose on the Easter Sunday attacks. Chaired by retired Supreme Court Justice S.I. Imam, the committee includes retired commander of the Sri Lanka Air Force, ACM Jailat Virakodi, and President's Counsel Harsha A.J. Souza as members. On the 5th of September, the, channel, the UK's Channel 4 released a controversial documentary titled Sri Lanka's Easter Bombings, Dispatches. Via the expose, a whistleblower named Hansir Azad Maulana, who was a spokesperson of the Pillayan led Tamil Makkal Viduttele Pulikal Party, claims to have orchestrated a meeting in 2018 between senior military intelligence official Major General Suresh Saleh and the Islamic State affiliated bombers to hatch a plot to destabilize the country. However, Major General Saleh vowed to take legal action if the documentary airs any material intentionally or unintentionally aimed at tarnishing his reputation connected to the Easter Sunday attacks without substantial evidence.
Now, State Minister of Finance Ranjit Simbala Piti affirmed that the domestic debt optimization process will be concluded within the upcoming week, highlighting that the optimization process of development bonds and pension funds were already successfully completed. The State Minister went on to say that the categories of bonds owned by the Central Bank as well as advances given to the government are to be subject to optimization and completed within the next two or three days. Api Desia Nai Prasastakarne, Api Tama, Sartako, Karaganem Labano, then Desia Nai Prasastakarne, Kotaski Hippactino, Ekaktamai, Sangwar de Bandumkar, Bankusatu Pautin, Anitamai, Islamica Aramuzal, Islamic Aramuzal, Tamai, Sevakar Sadak Aramuzala, Sevakar Karamuzala, at Latin. Dita Tamatara, Mahabankusatu Pautin, Raja, Bandumkar Saha, Sesham Raja, Duna, Pandagar Duna Tikara, and Mekotas Hatter, the Mekotas Hattering, Sangwar de Bandumkar, Api Julima Sausan and Kotaman Nimakara, Prasastakarne. Ye the name and Kota. Visami Karamudalula, Prasakarne, Nimakara. Then I put in Mahabanko Satu Pavatina, Mandum Karasaha, Raja Duna Tikara Pilman. They made dinner deca, Tuna Tulata, Ekatu Nimakarno. It will appear Pahadiloma, Mesatia Tulami, Dir Satia and Quota, Deshi and I Prasakarne, Nimakaraganapulo. Now, following further updates on Sri Lanka's debt, the global credit rating agency Fitch Ratings has downgraded the country's long term local currency issuer default rating to restricted default from C while affirming long-term foreign currency issuer default rating also at restricted default. The agency outlined several key drivers behind its decision to downgrade Sri Lanka's ratings, including distressed, distressed debt exchange, the continuing local currency debt service, and an incomplete local currency restructuring. Fitch Ratings has downgraded Sri Lanka's long-term local currency issuer default rating to restricted default from C. The ratings on its local currency bonds tendered in the domestic debt exchange have been downgraded to D from C, while its four other local currency bonds not tendered in the domestic debt exchange have been affirmed at C. Meanwhile, the long-term foreign currency issuer default rating has been affirmed at RD, and the ratings of Sri Lanka's foreign currency bonds have been affirmed at D. Outlining the key rating drivers, the agency said the downgrade of Sri Lanka's long-term local currency issuer default rating reflects the partial completion of an exchange of Sri Lanka's treasury bonds on the 14th of September as part of a broader domestic debt optimization launched in July 2023. The DDO also includes conversion of treasury bills held by the Central Bank of Sri Lanka into treasury bonds, which has not yet been completed. In Fitch's view, the exchange of treasury bonds constitutes a distressed debt exchange under the agency's criteria, given the maturity extension of the treasury bonds represents a material reduction in terms versus the original contractual terms, and given that the exchange is needed to avoid a traditional payment default. Furthermore, Fitch highlights that eligible bonds for which tenders were received and accepted have been exchanged into 12 new instruments of equal size and the same aggregate principal amount maturing between 2027 and 2038. Accepted tenders reached about 37% of the outstanding principal amount of eligible bonds outstanding as of 28th of June 2023. Accepted tenders were predominantly by superannuation funds, which will face high tax rates on income from Treasury bonds if they did not meet the participation threshold. Fitch also believes that Sri Lanka has continued to service Treasury bonds throughout the DDO process and that Treasury bonds not tendered in the exchange will continue to be serviced as per the original terms, including but not limited to the entirety of the 12 series of Treasury bonds out of the 61 eligible series for which no valid tenders were received. Four of these 12 series were rated by Fitch and were affirmed at sea prior to withdrawal. The agency also outlined issues related to incomplete local currency restructuring and default in foreign currency IDR as key drivers behind its decision to downgrade Sri Lanka's long-term local currency issue default rating to restricted default. Now, Meanwhile, former Central Bank Governor Ajit Nivad Cabral said the government's bankruptcy declaration last year was an organised move and not a coincidence. He made these comments today while speaking before the Parliamentary Select Committee tasked to investigate causes for Sri Lanka's financial bankruptcy. In July this year, a parliamentary select committee under the chairmanship of Sri Lanka Pudujana Peramuna parliamentarian Sagar Karyavasam was appointed to investigate causes for financial bankruptcy declared by the government. This morning, former Central Bank Governor Ajit Nivad Cabral was summoned before the parliamentary select committee and was inquired. Sarala Madhi Nivedak Nikutkarmi, Sri Lanka Swahiri Videshana, Eka Parshiko Pahari, Kadibudi, Tirne Kermi, Tatak Vashin, Sri Lanka, even Iranava Atkar Demin, Sri Lanka Baladar and Keeper Deniku Katu to Kirim, Akta Vashem, Mahat, Pudumakar Kriava, Pen, Keta Vashaki, Burate, Artike, Amu Amue, Vinashikirim, Mehdi, Me Tirne, Pasubim, Salaka, Beluho, Peniane, Ambing, Sidu, Ekak Novanabat, E Kalek, Tisita, Sabidana, Atmukov, Sri Lanka, Mevini Banklu, Bahaka, Gudru Karanata, Evenitha, Pat Karanata, Kuru Pakarma, Karaha, Sidu. 
उग्रेवा Now, Central Bank Governor Dr. Nandilal Virasinghe said it is impossible for the government to expect free education and health of good quality without the collection of sufficient taxes by the government. Addressing an event in Colombo, Dr. Virasinghe said the people should pay their fair share of taxes in order to ensure that the country's population receives a quality public service. The inauguration of the 31st Annual Academic Congress of the College of Ophthalmologists and the Association of Vitreo Retina Specialists of Sri Lanka was held last evening in Colombo. Central Bank Governor Dr. Nandilal Virasinghe graced the occasion as the chief guest of the event. In Sri Lanka, we know historically we have had a very good public health and education. But the question is that whether we can sustain this kind of model for how long. And this is the challenge that the issues that we are seeing these days in the delivery of public services. We you know, see the media, we see a lot of doctors, trade unions of doctors and health professionals coming to media and complaining about we don't have sufficient facilities, sufficient financing. to provide the services and the same time we are seen in the recent past with tax increases complaining that these tax rates are too high their living standards have gone down as a result doctors are migrating and going abroad these are all interrelated issues but as happened so far last 70 years successive governments have been able to provide those services not necessarily out of their incomes but through borrowings and government has been borrowing and providing those services but at some point now we have come to a situation government is no longer be able to sustain that kind of borrowings and the debt has become unsustainable so now we have to find a different ways of providing these services this is where going forward i don't think the current system of providing health and education is not going to be sustainable unless we have a complete system change in the provision of these services in different ways first one either the people who are earning income should be able to pay sufficient amount of taxes as revenue for the government so the government has sufficient resources to provide those services in return to the public but if you are in a system where the people who are supposed to pay taxes are not making proper contributions to make the public services and yet you can't expect the similar level of services that you would be able to deliver as a public service then obviously other model is that you have let it that services on the private basis then the problem is that the low income people who can't afford to pay for the services as a private service and they will be left out then we would not have this kind of development that we are seeing so far in terms of health and education that is where we need a system where this public services given out of taxpayers should be targeted to people who can't afford and the people who can afford to pay they should be made pay for the service either through direct taxation or directly the usage of the services that people who can afford this is where what you call other countries private insurance is another one of the models that we don't have that kind of model this is where we have to target the public service to people who only need that service who can't afford and people who can pay for the service we should be able to pay for that that's one model or if everyone would want to have a similar access to public services then everyone should be even from low income to middle income to high income people should be willing to pay their fair share of contribution to provide the service to the whole population that's a much more fairer distribution and allocation of resources this is one of the two models we are neither there nor here that's why our system is not sustainable Now on the legal front the provisions of the new anti-corruption act which aims to enhance transparency in governance and public confidence in the government came into effect today. 
The new legislation intends to establish an independent commission to detect and investigate allegations of bribery, corruption and offences related to the declaration of assets and liabilities and other associated offences. It further seeks to give effect to obligations under the UN Convention Against Corruption and any other international convention on the prevention of corruption. The anti-corruption bill was passed with amendments without a vote at the committee stage in Parliament on the 19th of July. Accordingly, the Anti-Corruption Act was certified on the 8th of August 2023. Thereafter, Minister of Justice, Prison Affairs and Constitutional Reforms Dr. Vijay Das Rajapaksha issued a gazette notification making the 15th of September as the date on which the Act comes into force. On the same note, the Assistance to and Protection of Victims and Crime Victims of Crime and Witness, Witnesses Act No. 10 of 2023 came into effect today. Now, a court order was issued by the Court of Appeal to not move organized crime syndicate leader Nadun Chintaka alias Harakkata without prior notice. Further probes are underway on his attempted escape from the CID custody, allegedly with the assistance of a police constable. Meanwhile, in Horana, a 45-year-old individual who was being beaten up in an attempted murder was rescued by the police based on a tip-off received pertaining to the attack. With that, here are some updates around the island in brief. The Court of Appeal has given orders not to move organised crime syndicate leader Nadun Chintaka alias Harakata from the location where he is detained without prior notice given to the judiciary and the Attorney General. Harakata has attempted to flee the custody of the CID allegedly with the assistance of a police constable who is believed to have fled Sri Lanka soon after the incident. Probes are underway into the criminal's recent failed attempt to escape. Based on a tip-off received by its intelligence unit, the Horana police prevented a murder attempt. A 45-year-old individual had been reportedly attacked with the intention to commit murder before the police had intervened to rescue him. The victim was admitted to hospital for treatment and investigations have commenced to bring the suspects into custody. Meanwhile, a 29-year-old suspect was apprehended in the Hingula area following a tip-off received by the Organised Crime Division of the Special Task Force. The suspect is reportedly a key protégé of Dan Rudder, an organised crime leader and drug trafficker. Following the apprehension, 20 grams and 600 milligrams of heroin in possession of the suspect were seized by the police. In other news, the body of a police constable who was reported missing following a raid conducted at an illegal liquor factory in Kilinochi area was recovered today. The body of the 28-year-old police constable was found floating in the Malayalapuram lake. For the latest in the world of business, join us on the other side of the short commercial break. Stay with us. Kondo Mata Pirali Karana Balla Pudu Ankarya Mahindra Yuvo Demo Vithin Vendama Godai Kodama Thamai Swaraj Tractor Demo Vithin Welcome back. Now in your business news, Head of the State-Owned Enterprise Restructuring Unit, Suresh Shah, says that new law to govern the state-owned enterprises or SOEs will be introduced by the end of this year. Addressing a panel discussion themed State of Enterprises in Sri Lanka, an asset or liability for Sri Lanka, organized by the Frederick Newman Foundation for Freedom, Shah called on all political parties to avoid the topic of SOE reforms during the election campaigns. Meanwhile, parliamentarian of the Samagi Janabalavege, Dr. Harsha De Silva, said that his party is committed to implementing SOE reforms in a way that benefits the general public. Meanwhile, independent parliamentarian and member of the Freedom People's Congress, Professor Charita Herat, meanwhile, said that, government, that the government must engage in a segment-based approach to identify the SOEs which need to be privatised. A panel discussion on state-owned enterprises in Sri Lanka, an asset or liability for Sri Lanka organised by the Friedrich Nauman Foundation for Freedom and cross-party youth political initiative Next Gen SL was held recently in Colombo. How alive are you personally as, as an individual politician with these reforms? I'm personally alive as an individual I am for reform, however, I am for transparent reform. And that does not necessarily mean privatizing everything. And there are multiple ways in which we can look at this question and there are different ways in which you can skin this cat. As the chair of the Committee on Public Enterprises earlier, you were for restructuring, but now you say privatization is not essential and that it opens doors to nepotism and all other uh, avenues of corruption. 
I am for the restructuring of some of the state-owned enterprises. We need to identify what is the role of the state and what are the enterprises or engagement that we are leaving to the state. Since our situation and the context is different than some of the other experiences, whether we could look at the segmentations of the existing state enterprises where we can look at what kind of enterprises should be kept within the state process and what we could get out from the state and to leave for the restructure. What stage of the divestment process you're at now? Cabinet has given in principle approval for the divestiture of seven enterprises. A transaction advisors have been appointed for those. They are on the ground. They have started work. We hope to have some of the less complicated enterprises divested by the first quarter of next year and then the more complex ones in the second quarter of of next year again. Are you looking at preventing avenues for corruption where close confidants or friends of your friends will be granted the management of these entities? These are common concerns and controversies surrounding the reforms agenda. Nobody's friend is going to get anything. I can assure you that. We have a divestiture process that is approved by cabinet that will be made public very soon. One of the things in that divestiture process is that we will not accept unsolicited proposals. All the divestitures that happen will go through a competitive bidding process. There are checks and balances. For example, our unit is only a facilitator. We don't evaluate anything. The evaluations are done by two independent teams. Recommendations to cabinet will be made by independent teams, not by our unit, not by our team. So we have built in certain checks and balances. And what is the sentiment there in Germany now, especially given the global economic sentiments and uh, the, the status of these privatized entities? When you look at the former privatization processes, for example, nobody is demanding to reinstitute the monopoly of the telecommunication of the former state on enterprise. On the contrary, um, we do have a lot of discussions now about the question, should we sell the rest of the publicly hold shares? How does that affect regulation? One of the challenges we have is getting better, broader internet access. And it's my interpretation uh, that this mixture of ownership and being in the role of regulator hasn't helped in getting fast internet into Germany. You can take us to the time line very quickly of this process, whether we are going to see any steps taken end of this year, next year. There are some other things which we are working on, which is uh, uh, a state-owned enterprise act or a law. Hopefully that will get to parliament by December this year. We are working on that. Uh, we are getting uh, a technical collaboration from the World Bank on that. And we hope that uh, people like Harsha and Charita actually help us pass the law. Then thereafter there will be a creation of a holding company. I mean, I think every one of us have heard of uh, Temasek. We are not saying we'll be Temasek in year one, but that is something that we can aspire to going forward. But initially, whatever enterprises that the state wishes to keep within itself and to control, those should come under the holding company and then hopefully they'll be managed more professionally, more efficiently. If you may address the question of how a regulatory measures and policies will be taken so that government after government, these measures will not be undone or reversed. The laws are there, but unfortunately, from the Sri Lankan context, a 51% majority, a simple majority in parliament can change these laws. So I think we need to find a mechanism going forward where when good laws are enacted and there there have been some, like the Fiscal Management Responsibility Act, for example, a very good piece of legislation in the past, but not followed to the letter. So, so we need to have mechanisms to make sure that some of these good laws remain. I have actually a much bigger concern than this. And election season is coming, from what we hear in the press, and not just state-owned enterprise reform, but I'm afraid that the political culture in this country is such that with election season coming, that all these reforms are going to come to a standstill, a hard stop. So my appeal really is to two types of people. Firstly, it is the politicians. Please don't touch the reforms on the campaign trail. Find a different way to compete. Secondly, my appeal is to the citizens of this country. Don't let the politicians make the reforms an issue on the election campaign. Well, Suresh, I'm sorry, that is going to be one of the major debates in the election campaign, you know, whether this reform is going to happen or not. So you can't wish that away. 
I'll tell you one thing. We need to do the reforms. SJB is not going to get on the political platform and say we are going to stop reform. We need to ensure that citizens of this nation benefit from that reform. Now, meanwhile, the Colombo Stock Exchange closed in red today, dragged down by a decline in consumer staples and communication services. The Colombo Stock Exchange All Share Price Index settled down at 0.58%, ending at 11,466.73 points. Distilleries Company of Sri Lanka and Selinko Insurance were the top losers on the index, falling 2.9% and 3.6% respectively. Trading volume on the index fell to 36.8 million shares from 51.2 million shares in the previous sh session. The S&P Sri Lanka 20, meanwhile, fell by 0.61% to settle at 3,244.51 points. The market's turnover fell to 784.1 million rupees from 1.45 billion rupees in the previous session. The capital goods sector was the top contributor to the market turnover, while food, beverage and tobacco sector was the second highest contributor. Foreign investors were net buyers, purchasing stocks worth 64.3 million rupees, while domestic investors were net sellers, offloading shares worth 752.5 million rupees. Now let's take a look at how the rupee traded against other major currencies during the day. Now on Sri Lanka's corporate front, 8 Conspense Hotel Holdings PLC announced that DST Jawardhana, who is the executive director of the company, has been appointed as the joint deputy chairperson and joint managing director of the company. Meanwhile, Dr. Kanchana Sanjeevan Arangudu was appointed as an executive director and the CEO of the Ambion Group with effect from yesterday. With that, let's take a look at our corporate news segment for the day. Pursuant to Section 8 of the listing rules of the Colombo Stock Exchange, Aitken Spence Hotel Holdings PLC announces that DST Javardhana, the executive director of the company, has been appointed as the joint deputy chairperson or joint managing director of the company. The appointment came into effect on the 14th of September. In another change in leadership, Dr. Kanjana Sanjeev Narangoda was appointed as an executive director of the company and as the Ambion Group CEO with effect from yesterday. Dr. Narangoda currently serves on the boards of Millennium ITESP, Econtech Private Limited, Dankoto Porcelain PLC, Taprobain Capital Plus Private Limited, Colombo City Holdings PLC, and Showed Capital Private Limited as a non executive director. Meanwhile, on behalf of Shalima PLC, Carson Management Services informs that Good Hope Asia Holdings Limited has decided to extend the closing date of Shalima PLC's exit offer as defined in the offer document from the 18th of September 2023 to the 10th of October 2023. With the intention of managing the expectations of shareholders who accept the exit offer prior to the 18th of September, based on the timeline specified in the offer document, Good Hope Asia Holdings Limited will pay and settle the purchase consideration due to such accepting shareholders within 21 calendar days from the closing date as communicated in the offer document. Shareholders who accept the exit offer between the closing date with the revised closing date will be paid and settled within 21 calendar days from the revised closing date. And with that, we wrap up tonight's edition of Adha Dharna First at Night. Stay in touch with us on www.adhadharna.lk for the latest developments around the clock. Thank you. Have a great night. For news and information you can trust 24 hours a day, visit adhadharna.lk.